Okay. So this is the technological singularity explained and promoted. So the objectives after the song, understand one should not fear complexity. Do not seek the one great truth. There are many truths and they can be true concurrently. Understand the three main schools of belief about the singularity. Understand the four main paths to the singularity. Understand the history of the singularity and Marcus Hutter's main ideas about it. Understand the challenge of promoting the singularity and the idea behind Future Day and Longevity Day. So what's new in 2022 is that I'm actually working with Marcus Hutter. Um, and so there's a closer relationship. Uh, we've written a grant. We hear about uh, whether we will be asked to write the full proposal in March. And I suspect that we will be asked to write the full proposal. It's about the future being human and the way that uh, artificial intelligence could assist in solving the big 13 challenges of humanity. Um, and the idea of longevity day sort of flows in and out of the course. Longevity is an amazingly unpopular concept in Canada. So, so there hasn't really been a, a strong uh, national longevity effort, although in most other first world countries there is. So um, anyway, in, in the winter, we celebrate Future Day, which is March 1st. And closer to that, we will talk about that more. Do not fear complexity. There's beauty and complexity. Your significant other is complex. The real world is complex. Perfect quadruple think with equipoise. Um, seemingly contradictory ideas can all be true. One can find a balance between them. For instance, in my field of transplantation, organ transplantation, the future is promotion of deceased donor donation till there are no waiting lists and tolerance and tissue engineering repair and stem cell generation of new organs and organs from pigs, <laughs> all those things together. So, so it's not like we we're looking for one answer to things. And in general, Peter Diamandis, the CEO of the X Prize and of uh, uh, Singularity University Chancellor says, when faced with a choice between two des desirable goals, choose both. <laughs> you can't always do that, but it's not a bad idea. So in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, the world is confronted that's much more organic than expected. Main reason I use this story is I think it crosses cultures. Most stories don't really cross cultures and like you've never heard of this story and other people have, whereas Alice in Wonderland is, 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 is pretty broadly known, I think worldwide. So think of that world then. The main difficulty Alice had was in managing her flamingo. So in the croquet game, the flamingo was the mallet, a hedgehog was the ball, all this kind of thing. It, it was a very unexpectedly organic circumstance. Whereas we face something that's exactly the opposite where uh, the world may be much less organic than expected and could develop without us Maybe that world doesn't really need us anymore. So, th so that's one of the challenges then for us to think about. <clears throat> so the three main schools of belief about the singularity, accelerating change, the event horizon, 
and intelligence explosion. The link I sent you for Marcus Hutter's slideshow with audio is a discussion of intelligence explosion. And maybe it's important just to reiterate again, you don't have to understand every slide. I don't understand every slide. There was an amusing conversation on the phone between Marcus Hutter and, and me ab about uh, one of the, the slides there. I'll, I'll tell you when, when we get to it. Um, but he couldn't believe that I <laughs> couldn't understand. But um, so Jonathan Schaefer, the former Dean of Science, said that that PowerPoint is very interesting, but like the most difficult to understand PowerPoint he'd, he'd ever encountered. So if you feel, feel that way, that's okay. And you'll, you'll find that the major parts of that is not on any exam that we give you. It's just a good experience to, have, to, to think of how complicated and, and uh, yeah, how deeply you can get into to this story of what's going to happen as uh, the singularity explodes. So the four main paths to the singularity, create an artificial intelligence that exceeds human intelligence, build human computer interfaces that allow humans to go beyond their innate intelligence to a significant extent, so-called cybernetics singularity, find ways in biology to improve upon natural human intellect. Probably that would be unacceptably slow, but on the other hand, maybe we'll get better at gene editing. Maybe it will be faster. Build large computer networks in which beyond human intelligence emerges. So in 2010, I became the only full-time university faculty member taking the Singularity University ex executive course. Most of the other people taking it were like corporate CEOs and people from government and startup companies and that sort of thing. Ray Kurzweil, he's the best known thinker in this area of uh, exponential change and the singularity and sometimes you'll hear him criticize this um, someone hold, holding narrow rigid views and I think nothing could be farther from the truth. You, you realize most of his books start out by answering criticism. People send him you know critiques or, or, or critical questions and so that's where most of the books come from. So if you have a criticism, he's heard that criticism before and he's actually reachable. You can contact him and he, he will write back to you and uh, you'll probably learn, learn a lot because in, in addition to answering your question, he'll tell you some other related things you had not thought about. Um, I was at the premiere of one of his uh, movies. <laughs> I thought you should wear a tux. That, that's what one does at a premiere, I, I thought. But I was the only one in a tux. But he was very happy there was someone there in a tux. And I've been eating these chips. And, and my hands were completely covered with chip fragments and dust. So when I shook his hand, <laughs> what is this guy with sandpaper hands? But anyway, uh, that that's kind of how how we met, and we're still in contact. So, what about the history of this area? This you might want to pay attention. It's on the exam. So, anyway, in 1847, R. Thornton, the editor of the Expounder of Primitive Christianity. How's that for a title? Wrote about the recent invention of the four function mechanical calculator. Such machines by which the scholar may 
by turning a crank, grind out the solution of a problem without the fatigue of mental application would, by its introduction into schools, do incalculable injury. But who knows that such machines, when brought to greater perfection, may not think of a plan to remedy all their own defects and then grind out ideas beyond the ken of mortal mind. Yeah, so that's the first description of the idea of the technological singularity in 1847. In 1863, four years after Darwin published on the origin of the species, Samuel Butler published the letter captioned, Darwin Among the Machines, compares human evolution to machine evolution, prophesizing half in jest that machines would eventually replace man in the supremacy of the earth. In the course of the ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. The letter raises many of the themes now being debated by proponents of the technological singularity. In Erewhon, which you will all notice is nowhere backwards, Butler argued that there is no security against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness. In the fact of machines possessing little consciousness now, a mollusk has not much consciousness, reflect upon the extraordinary advances which machines have made during the last few hundred years and note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. The more highly organized machines are creatures not so much of yesterday as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with past time. This is Marcus Hutter. It's quite interesting. I'm also working with his father <laughs> and his father is very sort of outward looking, looking at how AI can fix problems worldwide. Whereas Marcus is more looking internally, what's going to happen to us as AI becomes transcendent. And one of the cool things about this description, Can Intelligence Explode? It gives you ideas of what the singularity will actually be like to witness. And nobody else seems to have any idea about that. So this is another thing you need to know that uh, what, let's see. Oh. Yeah, so um, these 28 slides are uh, from Marcus Hutter's slide set. Some of you may have watched that in his own version. He has rather darker colors, and I figure the subject matter is dark enough. You don't need dark colors on the, on the slides. So the, these are basically those same 28 slides with, with a brighter background. So the idea of the singularity was described by science fiction writer Stanislaw Ulam in 1958, I.J. Good, 1965, Ray Samanoff, 1985, and Werner Vinge, who's still out there doing stuff in 1993. And uh, it was widespread popularization, took place through Kurzweil's books. 1999, 2005, 2017, and there are others since then. The uh, Singularity Summit, uh, Singularity Institute, uh, uh, and uh, various philosophers, including David Chalmers and Marcus Hutter. Um, this is just another depiction of Moore's Law. Um, you need to not only know about this uh, Moore's Law curve, but also have your own thoughts about it. So you can tell the story of Moore's Law and uh, exponential change 
uh, from your own unique perspective. That's one of the benefits of this course, that you will become able to do that. And the idea is that in 2035 to 2045, machines will become as smart as the whole aggregate human race, and that will change everything. They will then be in charge of future development of the earth. And if we want to know what's going on, we'll have to cooperate with them in order to figure that out. Moore's law, uh, price performance of computing doubles about every 18 months. It's now been valid for over 50 years. And it looks like even as uh, the technology of chips change, still Moore's law stays valid because it becomes more and more efficient and you go from 2D to 3D and all sorts of things like that. As long as there is a demand for more computation, Moore's law could continue to hold for many more decades before computronium is reached. Computronium is where sort of everything started into computing and computers. In 20 to 30 years, the raw computing power of a single computer will reach 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16th flops per second. Uh, and that's about the same as the human brain. Uh, some conjecture that software will not lag far behind and acute general, uh, sorry, um, uh, it, it will be possible to uh, reverse engineer or simulate the human brain, human level AI in 20 to 30 years. These are the various phases of um, human life. Originally, um, computing did double very quickly, <laughs> doubled every 20, 200, 250,000 years in the Stone Age, and with agricultural economy and farming doubling every 900 years, and then with the Industrial Revolution doubling every 15 years, and now every 1.5 years, and uh, it'll get a lot faster than that, uh, doubling monthly or something like that in the future. These are. Another way to look at evolution, and the top part of this is something I require you to know. <laughs> what is the final phase? That's where the universe wakes up. Yeah, so patterns of matter and energy in the universe become saturated with intelligent processes and knowledge. Epoch six. Yeah, so this is the slide where Marcus Hutter couldn't believe that I couldn't understand it. Um, but basically, if you had a library of all books, the information content would be approximately zero. Uh, and, and because you couldn't index it, it would have misprinted books as well as properly printed books, books with blank pages, so on. So having all information turns out to be having no information. Uh, if you have a hard time understanding this slide, realize that I also did, <laughs> most students do, but yeah, anyway, it just gives you an idea of how complicated it is to figure out exactly where we are headed. Maybe a society of increasing intelligence will become increasingly indistinguishable from noise when viewed from the outside. Each way outsiders cannot witness the true intelligence singularity. So, um, the expansion inward outward usually follows the pathway of least 
resistance, outward explosion will stop when all accessible convertible matter that can be made into computing has been used up. Historically, mankind has always been outward exploring, sort of interested in, in the world of Marcus Hutter's father, Reinhard Hutter, rather than inward exploring. Just in recent times, it's been more interest in inward exploring, miniaturization, virtual reality. <clears throat> so conclusion, strict intelligence singularity was neither experienced by insiders nor outsiders. Um, the technological seems more interesting for outsiders than insiders. Um, it, it looks like white noise to people watching from the outside. And if you're inside, it just seems like normal life because what's happening to you is happening to everybody else. So what is intelligence? There have been numerous attempts to define it. Marcus Hutter believes that he's done, done the best job. So this leg and Hutter, uh, definition, but there are many um, by various authors. If intelligence is not just speed, what is it then? What is it that super intelligences will actually do? So evolving intelligence, mutation, recombination, selection increases intelligence of useful for survival and procreation. Animals higher intelligence by some correlated practical cognitive capacity increases the chance of survival and the number of offspring. The humans' intelligence is now positively correlated with power or economic success and actually negatively with a number of children. Mimetics, genetic evolution has been largely replaced by mimetic evolution, the replication, whoops, sorry. Replication, variation, selection, and spreading of ideas causing cultural evolution. Which activities are intelligent? Which activities does evolution select for? Self-preservation, self-replication, spreading, colonizing the universe, creating faster, better, higher intelligences, learning as much as possible, understanding the universe, maximizing power over men and organizations, Transformation of matter into computronium, maximum self-sufficiency, the search for the meaning of life. Intelligence does not quite in equal rationality, reasoning toward a goal, more flexible notation, expected utility, maximization, and cumulative lifetime reward maximization, but who provides the rewards and how. Animals, one can explain a lot of behavior as attempts to maximize rewards, pleasure, and minimize pain. Humans seem to exhibit astonishing flexibility in choosing their goals and passions, especially during childhood. Robots reward by teacher are hardwired. Goal-oriented behavior often appears to be at odds with long-term pleasure maximization. Still, the evolved biological goals and desires to survive, procreate, parent, spread, dominate, are seldom disowned. Who sets the goals for superintelligence and how? Anyway, ultimately, we will lose control, and the AGIs themselves will build further artificial general intelligences if they're motivated to do so, and will, this will gain its own dynamic. Some aspects of this might be independent of the initial goal structure and predictable. Assume the initial virtual world is a society of cooperating competing agents. There will be a competition over limited computational, computational resources. Those virtuals who have the goal to acquire them will naturally be more successful in this endeavor compared to those with different goals and the successful virtuals will spread in various ways and others perish. So you'll notice this is getting darker and darker, but luckily we, we're gonna finish this soon and then 
get back to happier stuff. Soon their society will consist mainly of virtuals whose goal is to compete over resources. Hostility will be limited, will only be limited if this is in the virtual's best interest. For instance, current society has replaced war mostly by economic competition, since modern weaponry makes most wars a loss for both sides. Well, economic competition in most case benefits at least the better. The goal to survive and spread, whatever amount of resources are available, they will quickly be used up and become scarce. So in any world inhabited by multiple individuals, evolutionary and or economic-like forces will breed virtuals with a goal to acquire as much computational resources as possible. Virtuals will like to fight over resources. The winners will enjoy it while the losers will hate it. In such evolutionary virtual worlds, the ability to survive and replicate is a key trait of intelligence. But this is not a sufficient characteristic of intelligence. Bacteria are quite successful in this endeavor too, but not very intelligent. Alternative societies, you can imagine global cooperation and no hostile competition, but that would likely require a single powerful world government and to give up individual privacy and to severely limit individual freedom as in anthills or beehives, or it requires societal setup that can only produce conforming individuals. That doesn't sound like much fun. Might only be possible by severely limiting individuals' creativity, like flocks of sheep or schools of fish. Monastic virtual worlds, such well-regulated societies might better be viewed as a single organism or collective mind, and maybe the virtual world is inhabited from the outset by a single individual. Both virtual worlds could look different and more peaceful or dystopian than the traditional ones created by evolution. Intelligence would have to be defined quite differently in such virtual worlds. Formal intelligence measure. Intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. And formal definition implicitly captures most of not all traits of rational intelligence such as reasoning, creativity, generalization, pattern recognition, problem solving, memorization, planning, learning, self-preservation, and many others. has been rigorously formalized in mathematical terms. Properties is non-anthropocentric, wide-ranging, general, unbiased, fundamental, objective, complete, and universal is the most comprehensive formal definition of intelligence thus far. Copying virtual structures should be as cheap and effortless as it is for software and data today. The only cost is developing the structures in the first place, the memory to store and the computation to run them. Cheap manipulation, experimentation and copying of virtual life itself is possible. Another consequence should be that life becomes less valuable. Our society values life since life is a valuable commodity and expensive, laborious to replace, produce, raise. We value our own life since evolution selects only organisms that value their life. Our human moral code mainly mimics this, cultural differences and some excesses. If life becomes cheap, motivation to value it will decline. Abundance lowers value, analogies cheap, machines decrease the value of physical labor, some expert knowledge was replaced by handwritten documents, then printed books, and finally electronic files. Each transition reduced the value of the same information. Digital computers made human computers obsolete. The word computer originally meant humans who compute. In games, we value our own virtual life and that of our opponents less than real life because games can be reset and one can be resurrected. Governments will stop paying my salary when they can get the same research output 
from a digital version of me essentially for free? And why not participate in dangerous fun activity if in the worst case, I have to activate a backup copy of myself from yesterday, which just missed out this one, anyway, not too well going day. The belief in immortality can alter behavior drastically. <clears throat> Are there universal values? Are there any universal values or qualities we want to see or that should survive? What do we mean by we, all humans? or the dominant species or government at the time a question is asked, could it be diversity or friendly AI? Could the long-term survival at least one conscious species that appreciates its surrounding universe be a universal value? Okay, so that's the end of the Marcus Hunter slide set. Now I'm gonna raise your spirits, stimulate interest by talking about a new holiday future day. And you may think I'm going to tell you how each year the human activity surrounding Future Day will get greater, right? But actually, exactly the opposite is, is happening, as far as I can tell. So <clears throat> the fu first Future Day we celebrated was in 2012. Uh, and yeah, so, so we still have that banner. But that year, there were 16 celebrations around the world, which is the most that there have ever been. Every year since then, there are few, fewer cities celebrating Future Day. So it's not like a resounding success. Um, but the, these are the cities that celebrated it in 2012. And we ha have an idea, uh, you know about the Paris Salon. It was a group of people getting together in Paris that represented the artistic uh, community at the time, uh, artists and uh, poets and writers and, and uh, really the, the, the best of the best of, of uh, intellects alive at that time seemed to all be in Paris. And we had the idea of doing the same thing in Edmonton. <laughs> so, and, and at the uh, Art Gallery of Alberta, um, we haven't actually done this yet, but we are still planning it and, and maybe March 1st, 2023. Um, you know, the UN, is doing a big celebration and study of the future in 2023. They have never done that before, um, but it's interesting to think that we might do something uh, that would be linked somehow to that UN effort to celebrate the future in 2023. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've had various ideas about how we might do this and how face-to-face -face ver versus virtual it might be, but uh, I just wanted you to be aware of that as an idea. These are some of the students in 2014 <laughs> talking about this. Um, yeah, and you're probably aware that the Big Bang Theory has talked about the singularity. There, there's an episode where they talk about it directly, October 1st, 2010. Um, yeah, there is a screen capture from that episode and was the co-founder of Apple Computer where had um, a role in that particular episode. Uh, yeah, but if we're gonna make a success of a new holiday, it has to have a lot of things. It has to have visual identity and pageantry and all that kind of stuff. So we, we, we thought of uh, the Holly Festival from South Asia and uh, we, we could bring some features of it. 
you, you know about Color Me Rad. Color Me Rad is, is sort of like that um, idea brought to Canada or brought to North America. Uh, in South Asia, it doesn't always turn out that well. It began with animal, uh, with natural pigments, pigments from plants, uh, non-toxic pigments from plants, but it's hard to get beautiful, brightly colored pigments from plants. <laughs> A lot e e easier to get them from toxic paints and stuff like that. So it's a lot of uh, medical illness that comes from the, you know, respiratory and skin effects of some of these toxic uh, pigments. So we'd ha have to uh, correct that in some way. Then there's this poem for a long time on Facebook. This was the only poem I had on Facebook that's not by me. It's called Crayola Bomb. Maybe we should develop a Crayola Bomb as our next secret weapon, a happiness weapon, a beauty bomb. And every time a crisis developed, we would launch one. Would explode high in the air, explode softly, send thousands, millions of little parachutes into the air, floating down to earth box of Crayolas and we wouldn't go cheap either. Boxes of 64 with a sharpener built right in with silver and gold and copper, magenta and peach and lime and amber and umber and all the rest. And people would smile and get a funny look on their faces and cover the world with imagination. If that doesn't do it for you, if you've got a Roomba, robotic vacuum cleaner and do a time-lapse photograph, you get this. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And if that doesn't do it for you and you have a lot of resources, then you can do a hot air balloon festival. Yeah. But <laughs> this isn't as easy as it looks. And sometimes those hot air balloons get caught on high tension wires and then catch fire. And yeah, that, that, that it's, it's not all fun and game. Some of it is, is a little bit difficult to figure out. There are hot air balloon companies in Edmonton, uh, but there's never a time when the sky is this full of hot air balloons. So it take the, would change the culture quite a lot to do something like this. And there needs to be poetry and songs. So we thought of this uh, windmills of your mind round like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on an ever spinning reel, like a snowball on a mountain, carnival balloon, like a carousel. It's turning, running rings around the moon, like a clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face. And the world is like an apple whirling silently in space, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Yeah. And finally, you say, okay, well, those are the plans. What have you actually done? Well, one of the easiest things to do is to light the high-level bridge. You may think there's a long waiting list, but actually, if you think about it, you know that the situation is the opposite of that. Many nights when you're driving home, you'll realize there is no theme on the high level bridge because no one has requested any special colors. So actually, there are few, fewer people requesting special colors on the bridge than there are number of nights in, in a year. So, so anyway. Yeah, it, it's quite easy to get the high level bridge to uh, be whatever color you want and uh, name it after your organization for a day. So we did that in March 1st, 2015. And our uh, colors were green and orange. Um, that goes, goes along with, with the Edmonton Journal article about the course. They had these two robots that I still have at home. Um, and, and also this uh, graphic was also the future day 
demographic for 2015. Yeah, so we could do that again if you were interested, or maybe you have an even better idea. <laughs> Wouldn't be that hard. Uh, come up with an even better idea. So your suggestions are greatly welcomed. How can we capture the imagination, of the public to start everyone thinking about these matters? We need the mainstream public to regard the future technological singularity as fact, not fiction. And we need to promote organized thinking about the future in universities and beyond. Please talk up our light bridge success, even though it's a long time ago, and uh, discuss ways you would like to celebrate Future Day. So Rich Sutton is teaching on March 1st, um, but his own thoughts about uh, Future Day, sometimes he's kind of skeptical about it because you know, the, the future is always always in the future. It's it, most um, holidays celebrate something in the past. So it seems perhaps absolutely wrong to celebrate the future <laughs> with, with, a, with a holiday. But anyway, you can decide what you think about that. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. Now, one of the interesting things was how quickly this is gone. So it's only 247. So this was only 47 minutes. I'm aware it seemed a lot longer than that, right? Because the first part is so dysphoric. So that's what if 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 this course fails and if we don't influence any um, active human beings to sort of tilt the needle toward the kind of utopian side, then the way the first part of this teaching session went is the way life will be. Wouldn't that be awful? So anyway, yeah. So maybe that will motivate you to, to, to try to point the needle toward a, a utopia rather than apocalyptic future for the human race. Okay, so now, um yeah so already let's see here <clears throat> um yeah. so um let's go to gallery now and we can um discuss this. But the other thing we can do, if there are any students here who did not introduce themselves last time, then they can introduce themselves this time. Um, so is there anybody in that category who would like to tell us about themselves? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so hello everyone, my name is Pri. I'm um, I'm a third year student in bioscience and computing science. I'm doing, uh, I'm minoring in bioinformatics and I'm really excited to be here. Great, yeah. well, well, it's wonderful to have you here. And um, yeah, so. Uh, Thank you. Who else? Is, is there anyone else we didn't hear from last time? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe we did hear from everybody last time. Yeah. So, you know, the, the um, teaching sessions vary. This session is actually quite similar to the way it has been in previous years. Um, other teaching sessions are uh, really quite new, like what Taryn's doing, um, she's only done once before and it's quite different every time. So I, and, and um, also what we're doing on, on the 18th, uh, preparing a version of this course that would include inspiring astrophysics and uh, critical thinking for 
Nepalese students. Um, we have never talked about that before. So a week from uh, today, we'll have a lot more surprises than <laughs> today did. Yeah. And um, so any, any questions about the presentation today or about the course in general or anything? Are, are you all clear on what the singularity is? Doesn't mean you have to believe in it, right? You can still disbelieve in it, but you have to sort of know what it is, right? Yeah. Um, so the graphic behind me, the, the uh, grant that we submitted last week ha has a lot about like swarm intelligence, self-organizing systems and cellular slime molds. You know, they're sort of individual organisms then come together to form fruiting bodies and so on. Yeah, it, it's quite, interesting dy dynamism there. And you'll also recognize that this is kind of a conceptual diagram because birds don't look like that. <laughs> when birds aggregate in the sky, it, it's not quite what you're looking at there. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a human concept of kind of swarm, swarm in, intelligence and, and um, self-organizing systems. Um, so in you know, Brazil, there's uh, Iguazu Falls, probably the largest set of falls anywhere in the world. And I, I took pictures there of, of, of birds um, sort of, uh, getting close to the largest falls and sort of doing bird patterns, but you know, well, they're sort of having a shower from, from the falls. Anyway, that, that's sort of the, the coolest uh, self-organizing system I've probably ever, ever observed. So other questions? How is the uh, Grosdanic family reacting to, 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 to the chorus? First uh, time we've ever had three members from the same family taking the course. Is it turning out the way you expected or completely different or? Completely different for me. <laughs> I like didn't expect this at all. A lot of it is about technology and the advancements of technology and uh. I didn't even know what singularity was before I started looking into it um, for this class. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea. So it's it's definitely interesting and new a new concept. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of the most interesting past lectures. Okay, Libby, thank you for joining us. Libby, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so, so Leslie Cormack, the Dean of Arts, taught in this course in uh, 2012. Um, and, and in fact, that year, the Dean of Science and the De Dean of Arts taught in the course. And even back in 2012, we talked about the two of them, you know, debating each other. We thought this was the only setting where they really could debate each other, but they decided not to because the, the resource limitations within the institution were all already so great that it would was hard to see a good outcome. I mean, you, you wouldn't want as Dean of Arts or, or Science to some kind of lose the competition. On the other hand, you don't want to wound the other Dean. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, so, so we didn't do that uh, head, head to head thing. But what she pointed out, um, there are a number of things that would, you know, amuse you. Um, the video, she said, that video makes me look so much better than I really look in real life. 
<laughs> it's like amazing. I mean, we we had three, you know, videographers. We had we had the really expert lighting and so on. It was a time when the, the university employed a lot of full-time people in the kind of uh, videography lighting area, and it, they they really knew what they were doing. And I really thought she was underprepared because she came with only 16 slides, but that is the best presentation ever. So what does that mean? That's important in 2022, because if you can give the guest best presentation ever with 16 slides, that means you can do it with virtual Zoom backgrounds, right? because you have a choice of 16 virtual Zoom backgrounds. And I, I thought, you know, that, that, that um, can't possibly give a good time with 16 slides, but she, she, she gave a fantastic talk that sort of crosses, you know, everything from the Middle Ages to now and, and so on. She pointed out, that medicine in the Middle Ages was as complete as medicine today. Medical practitioners had answers for everything, therapies for everything, names for everything. If you went to a medical practitioner with something wrong with you, they would give it a name and tell you what you should be treated with. And we now would think that those, both the name of what it was and the treatment were completely bogus and didn't work. But let's be careful. <laughs> there could also be some things like that today, right? They were putting names on and giving therapies that could be just as bogus as they were in the Middle Ages. Anyway, it was, was, was a wonderful talk. Um, Jonathan Schaefer stepped down from being Dean, I, I guess, four years ago. And uh, so he, he is planning to teach uh, again in the course at some time. Uh, so that would be cool. And the Dean of Medicine, Dr. Hemelgarn, has agreed to teach in this course. That would be a first to have the Dean of Medicine teaching in the course. But when things get back to normal, <laughs> so <laughs> be a while, right? You know, I, I, I don't know how normal they, they have to be, but, you know, we keep thinking every term that maybe she could teach this term because, you know, it's not as bad as last term, but then there's Omicron and, and uh, so on. So, yeah. But anyway, she, she is keenly interested in the course and, and, and very pleased to see you kind of uh, activity that we have going on here. Um, questions, discussion, anything else you would like? To... I had a question. Yeah, yes. Um, it's kind of off topic, but in Hutter's um, PowerPoint, he talks about how intelligence is like upper bounded. Um, I was wondering if you could explain that a little more because it's kind of confusing to me, but I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I, I guess human biological intelligence is uh, upper bounded. Uh, that, um, you know, the, the cranial cavity limits the size of, 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 of what can be inside and so on. Yeah, I don't know quite all the parameters, but with brain implants, I think intelligence won't have an, an upper bound. And a lot of the things that I'm, I'm doing when I talk about Kardashev type one and type two civilizations and so on, I'm talking also about things that don't seem to have any, any upper bound, like how big a project could you conceptualize? You may think that putting a mega structure around the earth is like, well, as <laughs> big as you can get, but then the Kardashev type two is putting a, it around the sun. And then, yeah, I mean, that those Kardashev type three, type four. So 
When we originally did the focus group for this course, um, we talked about it being a course that stretches brains, <laughs> that causes you to think bigger than you've thought before. Uh, I think maybe we, we are succeeding in that in some instances, but I, I, I thank you for your question, but I don't think it, it, it's an absolute upper bound. It's just, if you're dealing only with the uh, biological human brain without anything added, then I think there are upper bounds. Uh, and to some extent there are trade-offs, <clears throat> Like if you went to a meeting with me, you'd say, oh, well, that'd be so amazing to go to a meeting with Dr. Solis. What could be the downside? Well, the, the things that you can easily do that I can't, <laughs> they're really simple. Like let's say we go to a meeting and there's a hotel where people are staying and there's the meeting venue and right, various shops along the way, right? Yeah. Well, without thinking about it, as you walk that route, your brain creates a very accurate map of, of, of like where you are now and, and where the hotel is and where the meeting venue is. You could go down a side street and uh, you know get off the route a little bit and get back very accurately. I can't do that. But it doesn't matter. Usually I'm there with other people and I just sort of follow them. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've met other very bright people who can't spell in the modern world. Not being able to spell doesn't matter at all. There's all sorts of spell checks and, and so on. And you, you can even sort of check your spell check to make sure that it's working, right? But I mean, the, the thing that used to be of, of memorizing proper spelling of words, she just didn't have that and it, it, it wasn't ever there. So like she has, so I, I'm talking about Sheila Moriber Katz. When I first met her, I mean, you, you think about what people first say when they, <laughs> she said, the thing about me is I'm just really, really smart. Who says that? <laughs> she said that. But she was, yeah. She she worked for, you know, the the Bill Clinton White House. Um, she was the head of the uh, alternative medicine sort of department within the White House. When Bill Clinton stepped down, she started working with me. So it was kind of a transition there, but yeah, she, she had lots of interesting, so she, she developed, she, she discovered Legionnaire's disease. There were these Legionnaires who met and then they all got sick and nobody knew what it was. And the CDC had a big team on it and they couldn't figure it out. So as a single researcher working in her own laboratory, she determined what the, uh, causative organism was uh, Legionella and, and uh, became very famous, was on the front page of the New York Times and all, all that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I worked with her for quite a while and um, yeah, so I, okay, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's interesting to think of the upper bound, not only of like intellect, but if you think of like what's uh, what's remarkable about me, just comparing me to most normal people, is, is also the you know personality, uh, you know, configuration. The, 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 the uh, great openness to, to experience and, and lack of uh, neuroticism, not worrying about things that don't need to be worried about. So that's very different from 
most people. A lot of normal people spend a lot of time worrying. And if you think about it, we kind of need those worriers in our, in our society without people doing, without somebody doing that worrying, a lot of dangers that we wouldn't be thinking about, right? So yeah, we, we need kind of semi-worried people. If everybody was, was like me, it probably wouldn't, well, they'd be happier maybe, but, but it really wouldn't work well if nobody was worrying about stuff. But most people do think that that like just ideas in general have an have an upper bound. You 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 can't go beyond a certain point. That's just crazy, you know. But the difference between innovation and crazy is sort of hard to find sometimes. So if you get it right, you know, uh, uh, get go. Being able to think bigger than other people think can be a very valuable thing. So other questions? All right. Well, you know, I, I think it wouldn't hurt you to get 14 minutes of your life back here. And, and if we um, stop uh, now, and uh, anyway, thanks for joining. Please uh, do the E-class work and uh, the other uh, preparation I've given you for Taryn's uh, session on young people reimagining human flourishing for uh, Thursday. Yeah, thank you very much and we'll see you then. Thank you so much, Dr. Celez. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care.